Greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag, the movie chat show here on the weekends. My name is John Campia. I'm the editor in chief of AMC Movie News, and I am so glad you decided to drop in today and make us part of your day. For those of you who don't know, very laid back show. Uh, think of it as kind of like talk radio. We're just sitting here, going to talk movies, just doing nothing but taking your email questions. And your questions from Twitter as well. And we're just going to talk movies for the next uh, 30 to 45 minutes. And uh, like I said, so glad you decided to come. And uh, without any further ado, let's just jump right into it today. And by the way, I'm going to let you know, you can send us your questions to amcmovietalk at gmail.com. You can email those anytime. And then all throughout the week, we pick out questions to use on a, on a AMC Movie Talk through Monday through Friday. And then we pick out a bunch more to use on AMC Mailbag here on the weekends. And uh, that's what we're going to do. We're going to get started with question number one. And the first question today comes to us from Zach Taylor, who writes, Hey, AMC Movie Talk uh, crew. Love the show. Thanks so much, Zach. You guys rock. I was watching one of your shows from last year recently, and you were talking about a Child 44 movie being made, and one of the actors was going to that was going to be in it was Philip Seymour Hoffman. Any news that they are going to do the movie and who will take Philip's, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's place? Thanks, and keep up the great work. Well, the question, the movie that Philip is, uh, is talking about here is Child 44. It's set in, uh, uh, in old Russia. And the lead in the film is being played by Tom Hardy, who plays a, an investigator investigating a child murderer in a society that doesn't even acknowledge that crime exists. So, you know, you can imagine his job is pretty tough. And in early 2013, the news came out that Philip Seymour Hoffman uh, was going to play. Uh, the, well, we didn't know if he was going to play the villain. A lot of us just assumed he was going to be the villain uh, in the film. And we were all excited about that. And... Um, so that's the movie he's talking about. So some people have been asking, hey, hey, so what are they doing with Child 44? Did they finish filming it? Are they going to have to replace him? As a matter of fact, Philip Seymour Hoffman dropped out of the film back, I believe, in July. I could be, might have been August, might have been June, but around, around July of 2013, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman actually backed out of the film. So he backed out and he was no longer in it. He was replaced. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe the film is already done shooting. I think it's in post-production now, if I'm not terribly mistaken. Um, so no worries about that. Uh, uh, as far as Child 44 goes, uh, the, the death of Philip Seymour Hoffman uh, didn't really have much an effect on that film. Uh, I'm not really sure. I, I have to look into seeing what other films um, Hoffman had on the go. Uh, actually, let me pull something up here because, I mean, you know, what's funny is that right now we're sitting here um, doing AMC Mailbag and it was doing AMC Mailbag. It was while I was in the middle of doing an AMC Mailbag episode last week or might might have been two weeks ago now that people on the chat board started putting in Philip Seymour Hoffman died. Philip Seymour Hoffman died. I'm like, what? And we looked and sure enough, like it, it had just been announced that Philip Seymour Hoffman had passed away. And, and by the way, the, the actor um, who has replaced uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman um, back in the summer is Vincent Cassell, uh, who is a great actor. A lot of you would probably recognize him most for his work in the um, uh, Ocean's 11 and Ocean 12, uh, Ocean's 13 films. But he's an amazing actor. He's fantastic. So they, they replaced him very well. Um, and But as far as Philip Seymour Hoffman, what else he had on the go... Um, Philip Seymour Hoffman, it said that, he, it, well, obviously he still wasn't quite finished his work on Hunger Games, but he had completely finished uh, Mockingjay Part 1, and he was just about finished Mockingjay Part 2. So they were able to find a way to work around to finish the film without him there. Um, and that was the only film he had on the go. He's got a couple other movies called God's Pocket and A Most Wanted Man. But as far as I know, those films were also finished production. The only thing he was working on at the time was Hunger Games. And uh, and, and thankfully for Hunger Games and for Hunger Games fans, uh, Hoffman was able to pretty much finish his work on that as well. So um, no need uh, to fret. Uh, if you're a Child 484 fan, no need to fret. Uh, they, they, Hoffman had dropped out last year, and they replaced him with Vincent Cassell, who is, I'd say, on par with Philip Seymour Hoffman. He, Vincent's a really great actor, and I think people are going to really love uh, what they see in him. All right, let's move on to question number two. 
The second question today comes to us from Bradley Fitton, who writes, Will Wolverine have bone claws for all of X-Men Days of Future Past? Well, for those of you who don't know what Bradley is talking about, um, at the end of, minor spoiler alert, not a big plot point, minor spoiler alert, uh, at the end of uh, Wolverine, the last Wolverine film, um, Hugh Jackman's uh, Wolverine had his claws chopped off. <laughs> and then later, you notice, you no, know, he's still got claws. The adamantium's gone, but he's got bone claws. I guess his body healed, and he had bone claws anyway. But the adamantium part of his claws were gone, so now his just claws are all bone. Um, and that happened in the comic books as well. There's a really famous scene in the comic book uh, history where, you know, the X-Men are battling Magneto, and then Magneto, who is a master of magnetism. So, you know, if anybody's going to fight Wolverine and have an easy time of it, it's going to be Magneto. And Magneto is, confront is confronted by Wolverine, and basically, I I'm just giving you a, a Coles notes here, basically Magneto says... You know what? You've just annoyed me too much, Wolverine. I should have done this a long time ago. Snaps his fingers, and it's pretty horrific what he does. But what he does is he pulls, in the comic books, he pulls all the adamantium out of Wolverine's body. So Wolverine's body is being torn apart as you see metal ripping out of his all over his body. Remember, his entire skeleton is covered in uh, adamantium. And so you see all the adamantium ripping out of his body. Obviously, if it wasn't for his healing factor, Wolverine would have been dead. And so for a long time in the comic books, uh, Wolverine, actually, when Wolverine thought um, that he didn't, he thought once he lost his adamantium, he thought maybe his claws were just adamantium. And it wasn't until a few issues later that he realized his bone claws came back out. He realized his, no, his claws are a part of him. They weren't built into him. His claws are a part of who he is. And so... His body regenerated his bone claws, but no adamantium on them. Uh, so the question is, is Wolverine going to go through all of X-Men Days of Future Past without the adamantium? Honestly, I don't have an answer for that. Um, I'm very curious to see what they do with it. And I, you know, I'm thinking off the top of my head, if anything in the trailers or the commercials or the clips we've seen so far online, if anything gives us a hint or an indication, if we saw his claws at all, I don't think we have yet. But my guess, remember, this is just a guess. My guess is he will be sans adamantium. I believe Wolverine will be bone claws, and I do believe it'll be for the whole film. Um, well, I mean, if he goes into his younger body, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I honestly, I don't know. If I had to venture a guess, I'm going to guess he does only have his bone claws for X-Men Days of Future Past. All right, let's go on to the next question. The next question comes into us from John Lutz, who writes, your show is great. Well, thank you, John. Uh, keep up all the great work you do every day. My question is about The Flash. Do you think now that he will be having his own TV show that he still may get a movie or get to be in the Justice League movie when we get one. Um, so basically what he's asking is, okay, now that Flash is, is coming on TV, are we, is there any chance for him to get his own standalone movie? Let's make something very clear. The Flash, as of right now, is not coming to TV. The Flash has a pilot ordered. And now there's a difference between having a pilot ordered and having it ordered for series. Those are two different things. Lots and lots of shows get pilots and lots and lots of shows never actually get ordered to series. They get a, a pilot show ordered from a, a network and then, you know, they got something in LA here coming up called pilot season where everybody's developing all these shows and they, and they get pilots ordered, but then you cross your fingers and hope that it gets picked up to series. Remember Wonder Woman had a pilot two years ago ordered. And it never went to series. They did a pilot, said, this sucks, this isn't what we want, and, uh, and, and never made it to TV. So as of right now, CW has a pilot of Flash ordered, but it has not been ordered to series yet. I have a feeling it will. I, I think most of us believe it will get ordered to series, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. As of right now, it's not ordered to series. It's only got a pilot ordered, and remember, so did Wonder Woman. But that aside, let's assume for a second that Flash does get its, its his TV show running and he does get ordered to series. So then the question becomes, what do you do with the Flash character in the cinematic universe? We know DC is keeping them separate. Um, and so do you have a Flash character 
that is a different Flash in a different universe for the movies going on while you have Flash on television. I don't know that they'll do that. Um, I personally don't think there's a problem with them doing it. I, I Honestly, I don't. I have no problem with them um, saying there's Flash on TV and then there's a totally different Flash in a different universe in the cinematic universe and that's a different Flash. Yes, his name's still Barry Allen or Wally West or whatever you want to call him. It's probably going to be Barry Allen. Uh, yes, it's Barry Allen, but it's a different Barry Allen. It's a different Flash. It's a different universe. I don't know that they do that. And I've said this before. I think them ordering a Flash show hurts the chances of Flash getting his own standalone movie and hurts the chances of Flash showing up um, in the Justice League. But I don't think it eliminates the chances at all. I, I think there is still a chance, but I think it hinders uh, the chances. I think it would be better for Flash's movie career if there was no Flash TV show. But remember, like I said, there's a lot we still have to wait and see. We still don't know if CW is going to order Flash to series or not. Um, if it doesn't, then I think that's good for Flash's chances in the movies. If it does, I think it hurts, but it doesn't eliminate the chance. There's still a possibility there. So let's adopt uh, a wait and see attitude right now. The first thing we got to figure out, is Flash going to be ordered to series? Then once that question gets answered, then we can worry about whether or not he's going to pop up in the movie universe or not. All right, let's move on to question number four. And question number four today comes from Zane Hashmi, who writes, uh, I do have a possible trade that might be feasible. Now, every once in a while, we like to play the trade game. Like if you could if picture one studio trading certain characters to another studio and getting certain characters back with that trade work. So that's what Zane's referring to. So Zane uh, writes, I do have a possible trade that might be feasible. And this is just for impression. Marvel trades the rights for Guardians of the Galaxy, Ant-Man, Doctor Strange, and, and Black Panther in exchange with Fox for the rights to the X-Men. Um, or the same deal could be made with Sony for the rights to Spider-Man. Could any of these deals work? Thanks, and bring on the filthy. All right. <clears throat> okay, so trades, here's the trick with trades. Like sports fans, like everybody um, who's a sports fan, let's say you live in Toronto, um, and you have... No, let's say what's even let's say you're, you're let's say you live in LA like I do and you're a fan of one of the worst teams in the league right now, the Los Angeles Lakers. And people on LA radio are saying, "Well, just trade for LeBron. Get LeBron." Well, that makes that sounds good. Yeah, just go trade for LeBron, LeBron except Miami ain't going to give you LeBron for anything you got. So, when you're proposing a trade, you have to come up with something that represents equal value for both sides, that you think both sides would go, yeah, I'll make that trade. That sounds good for us. And the other side has to say that too. So in this proposed trade that Zane is proposing, he's suggesting that Marvel sends to Fox, let's start with the Fox one, sends to Fox Guardians of the Galaxy, Ant-Man, Doctor Strange, and Black Panther in exchange for the rights to the X-Men. Okay. From a Marvel point of view... This is a good trade. From a Marvel point of view, this is a really good trade because X-Men are proven commodities. X-Men have 100 characters associated with them. We've already seen they have their main X-Men storyline. They've had their first class storyline. They've got a Wolverine storyline. So they can, from X-Men, you can do multiple franchises. It's a proven name. And um, you're giving up some future possibilities with Ant-Man, Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, Doctor Strange, uh, and what was that? And, and uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, Ant-Man, Doctor Strange, and Black Panther. So you're giving up some good stuff there, but if you're Marvel and you get offered a trade by Fox of giving up Guardians of the Galaxy, Ant-Man, Doctor Strange, and Black Panther in exchange for X-Men, you make that trade. That's a great trade for Marvel. However, this trade won't work. Why? Because if you're Fox, you'd have to have been in a serious car accident and suffered major brain trauma to accept that deal. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy, nobody knows him. Uh, remember, outside of core comic book fans, Doctor Strange, nobody knows him. Ant-Man, basically nobody knows him. Black Panther, nobody knows them. And none of them have been on the big screen yet. They're completely unknown. For all you know, these four films are all going to flop. With X-Men, if you're Fox and you've already got X-Men, you have already proven moneymakers. 
X-Men makes you money. Wolverine makes you money. X-Men First Class make you money. These are proven commodities that everybody knows. You already know they make you tons of money um, at the theaters. To trade that for completely unknown commodities. And by unknown, I don't just mean that a lot of people don't know who they are. I mean, you have no idea how they're going to perform at the box office. And if you take Black Panther... Let's let's start let's start with uh, say Ant Man. Ant Man's value drops if you take him away from the Avengers. Ant Man has a certain value, but a part of Ant Man's value is his connection to the Avengers, and you know he's going to wind up in the Avengers and in probably Avengers three. So there's value there, but as soon as you take him out of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Ant Man loses value. Guardians of the Galaxy is only going to get any buzz because of its association to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Take them out of that Marvel Cinematic Universe, suddenly they lose value. Um, same thing with Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange, great character and all, but the reason he'll have some pop is because he's in this Marvel Cinematic Universe. Take him out of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, loses a little, not as much as Ant-Man would, but he loses a little bit of his value. Same with Black Panther. He'll lose a little bit of his value. And so now, not only is it a bad trade to start with for Fox, but these commodities you'd be getting from Marvel, Guardians of the Galaxy, Ant-Man, Doctor Strange, Black Panther, now they're even less valuable because you own them instead of them being in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, so overall, does this trade work? No, not at all. Let's look at the same trade for Sony. If Sony um, were to... If Marvel were to offer that same trade, Guardians, Strange, Ant-Man, Black Panther, to Sony in exchange for Spider-Man, once again, good trade for Marvel, bad trade for Sony. Sony has, same, and the same stuff, Sony has a proven huge moneymaker in Spider-Man. They're already expanding Spider-Man's uh, universe because they're making a Venom movie, they're making a Sinister Six movie, and they've already got plans for Spider-Man 1, 2, 3, 4, and 4. They're already got Spider-Man up to 4 planned. And then the same drawbacks. Take those characters out of Marvel, suddenly they lose even more of the value. So the trade doesn't work. The trade doesn't work. It might become more interesting if you offer up, say, Guardians, uh, Ant-Man, Black Panther, Doctor Strange for one X-Men character, like, say, Wolverine. Then maybe Fox would look at that, but I... Even then, I don't see. But remember, we're talking fantasy sports here. I mean, this something like this would never happen anyway. But I, if I'm the president of either Fox or Sony, I do not make that trade. That's just me. You'd have to throw in a heavy hitter. You'd have to throw in a Thor. You'd have to throw in a Hulk. You'd have to maybe throw, maybe even Captain America to sweeten the deal a bit. And anyway, it's just a trade that doesn't work. So let's get on to the next question. The next question comes to us from Kadeem A, who writes... Absolutely love the show. Thanks so much, Skadeem. Uh, my question is in regards to James Cameron's Avatar. Do you think he missed a trick by waiting so long to start work on the sequels? The reason I ask is because when I first watched Avatar in 2009, I was amazed by the effects and thought it was a great movie. After rewatching it a few times, I felt the story was lacking big time and was just a collection of recycled material. Could the possible seven-year wait um, and a chance for the first film to settle over this period have an effect on the box office numbers for Avatar 2, 3, and 4 and possibly not hit the heights of the first movie? Well, can you, you, yeah, I mean, was it a mistake for Cameron and the studio to wait this long? to even get started on the next Avatar film. Yeah, it was a mistake. But it's not a catastrophic mistake. Will it? Will this long of a wait hurt? Yes. But I, I don't think it's going to cripple them, and I don't think it's going to hurt them all that much. For What I'm saying basically is this. Let's say the movie comes out in 2016, right? And it makes a billion dollars, okay? Let's for argument's sake say the movie comes out in 2016 and makes a billion dollars. I believe that if that movie came out in 2014, it might have made 1.15 billion, another 150 million. If it came out in 2015, I believe it would make 1.1 billion. And in 2016, 1 billion. If they go into 2017, even less. I, I, I do think they made a mistake by waiting this long. But I don't think it's going to be a mistake that has a huge negative ramification on it. But 
I am going to say this too. Even if the movie came out today or if it came out in 2015, I don't think Avatar 2 is going to make the same money that Avatar did. Um, because I think there was a novelty thing on top of everything else that was so good about Avatar. There was a novelty thing attached to it too that everybody was seeing it. So everybody went to go see it. But not everybody who saw it loved it. Um, a lot of people did. Some people didn't. So what I think is going to happen is I think the next movie is going to come out and I don't think it's going to attract everybody who went to go see it the first time around, the first Avatar. I don't think everybody who saw the first Avatar is going to come back to see the second one. But that being said, it's still going to make a crazy amount of money. It's going to make a crazy amount of money. Uh, so don't feel bad for James Cameron. Uh, don't feel bad for the studio. If, if somebody says, I don't think it's going to make as much money as the first one, that's not a... I mean, it's unfortunate for the studio. They'd like to make every single dollar that they can. But remember, they're still going to profit on this movie big time. So don't you lose any sleep for them. They're going to do just fine. But I don't think as many people will go to see it um, or see it two, three, four times in the theaters like they did. I think the novelty's worn off. Um, I've brought this up before, too. It's crazy. For as big of a movie as Avatar was... I remember the first Halloween after Avatar came out, you saw lots of Navi and other, you saw lots of Avatar costumes in Halloween, right? Halloween and costumes are kind of a cool uh, barometer of where the pop culture is at. And when Avatar came out in the first Halloween season, you saw lots of Avatar costumes and stuff like that. But the second one, not, la the last year I saw none. I, I, I swear, and now maybe you did. I'm just telling you what I saw. I saw none. Nobody dressed up as Avatar. I don't hear anybody ever talking about Avatar. It's not a part of the pop cultural uh, consciousness like a lot of other hit movies are. And guess what? I still I still saw lots of Heath Ledger Jokers walking around, and it's been years since The Dark Knight. Um, but Avatar is one of those films that hit at the right time, but I believe was never good enough to really become planted in the pop cultural consciousness. Um, and it's kind of faded away. So I, I think the next one, I think it's James Cameron, so it's going to be good. That's just a given. James Cameron's making it, it's going to be good. Um, so I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to make lots of money, but I do not believe um, that it's going to have the same success as the first Avatar. And really, who cares? That, that It's the biggest box office film of all time. Not coming up to the original is not that big of a blemish on your reputation okay it'll do just fine it just won't make as much all right the last mailbag question that we have for today and then i'll take some questions from the twitter stream the last mailbag question we have today comes for us from glenn magnola who writes do you think after entourage and veronica mars uh, do you think if after Mar uh, no you say when do you think after entourage and veronica, veronica mars do well enough at the box office more movies will be made after their tv shows end it's a fair question. We've got an Entourage movie on the way. We've got a Veronica Mars movie on the way. Um, uh, Veronica Mars, by the way, you're going to be able to see it. I believe, I think it's playing exclusively at AMC. I could be wrong about that, but double, double check. I think it is. You'd think I would know that. I'm just not that bright. Anyway, you all knew that already. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I mean, look, look let's, let's put it this way. Let's say Entourage and Veronica Mars both come out and both of them make 80 plus million in the domestic box office. There will be producers buying up t movie rights to TV shows left, right, and center. Left, right, and center. Um, of that, I have no doubt. If they're big hits, uh, like I said, even 70 plus million domestically. They make 70 plus million domestically. The, the producers lining up to buy TV rights or buy movie rights to TV shows. Here's the thing. It ain't going to happen. Especially for Veronica Mars. Uh, Entourage, I don't know. Entourage is such a pop cultural phenomena. It's possible that Entourage could hit 50, 60 million. I'm guessing. Um, but that's 70, 80. And Veronica Mars, I, remember, I think they made Veronica Mars for like 2 or $3 million. And they haven't put a big marketing campaign behind it. So they didn't spend the traditional 20, 30, or $40 million in marketing. I'm guessing they spent five, six million million in marketing. Maybe even less. So that's a movie that really only needs to make about $15 million to break even. Um, and I think it'll do it. I, I think Veronica Mars will, will hit $15 million. I do. I don't think it'll be much more than that, though. 
Um, so in the world of the theoreticals, if Entourage and Veronica Mars are huge hits, yes, I think it would have a huge influence on TV shows making the jump to the big screen. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think Entourage will do well. And I think Veronica Mars will do well in relation to the money it's spent on making and marketing it. But I don't think it'll do well in terms of overall box office. I don't like if you're going to compare it to um, put it on the same judging level as you would judge, you know, um, Ride Along or uh, uh, Think Like a Man 2 or, or other types of comedies or anything like that. I don't think it's going to measure up. But uh, it's a different standard. It's a different scale. So it's going to be with great interest that I think the whole industry sits back and watch how these two movies do. All right. With all that out of the way, uh, I still got some time here. So what I'm going to do is I have not pre-screened these. I have told you guys uh, on my Twitter before that I'm going to take some live questions from Twitter and you can send tweets to me at uh, AMC Movie News. So tweet a question to me at AMC Movie News and I'll read them as many as I have time to do, and it will go down. So I've got a whole bunch in the live Twitter stream pulled up here. So let's jump over and see what is in the Twitter stream. The first question we are going to start with is from Joshua Tisson, Tisson Yay? I, I'm sorry, I'm brutally butchering your name, Joshua. Anyway, Joshua writes, uh, at AMC Movie News, any news on a live-action adaptation of Robotech with Leo starring and Tobey Maguire producing? Who doesn't love um, playing robots? Um, no, I've, no, I never believed for a second that, that rumor that started going around that... Um, remember there's this one rumor floating around that Leonardo DiCaprio turned down Star Wars so he could do Robotech? B.S., Total BS, that whole rumor report. Um, now, Toby Maguire, for about seven years now, six or seven years, has been attached to Robotech as a producer, but I don't even know if he's still attached or not. I know they were trying for a very long time, uh, especially once Maguire got on board as a producer. A lot of people speculated he may actually star in the film, and they said, you know, we're moving ahead with this, but that was six years ago. Um, and then I think there was some kind of fight, much like with Voltron. I believe there was a fight going on about the rights to it. And I, I have heard nothing about real movement on it. The, the only thing I've heard about any movement with it was that BS report that came out about um, Leonardo DiCaprio was joining it and stuff like that. Um, wouldn't that be funny now if like two weeks uh, it officially gets announced by the studio that Leonardo DiCaprio is starring in Robotech? That would be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool, I gotta say. I don't think it's gonna happen, but that would be funny if it did, and I'd be all for it. But I haven't heard anything, honestly. I, I think that's pretty much ground to a halt for now. So we'll see what develops. All right, let's move on to the next one. And the next one comes from Starkiller535, who writes, uh, at AMC Movie News, what comes after Batman vs. Superman? JL, Justice League, or something else? Well, the rumor, that, that seems to make sense. But remember, it's still just a rumor. The rumor is that um, Warner Brothers wants to start production on a Justice League movie almost immediately after they're done shooting Batman vs. Superman. Um, some people have even speculated that the, that the main reason they bumped the uh, release date back to 2016, when it was originally supposed to come out in 2015, is so that they would have lots of time to or give themselves even more time to prepare a Justice League movie for 2017. So what... The, the speculation is, remember that word, speculation, all right? This is not official. This isn't confirmed, all right? The speculation is that Warner Brothers wants to have another movie out within a year after Batman vs. Superman. So if they didn't think they could have a Batman or a Justice League movie ready for 2016... They thought, well, we can have it ready for 2017, so then let's move Batman vs. Superman from 2015 to 2016. That way, there's only one year between when Batman vs. Superman comes out, or Man of Steel 2, and Justice League. That that makes sense. Even though there's nothing confirming that, that's, doesn't confirm, for all we know, they're going to make a Wonder Woman, Flash, Aquaman, and Cyborg movie first before they do Justice League. I don't know. But if that's their plan then it does make sense with all the moves we've seen DC do so far. Um, so I personally believe at this point that the next movie after Man of Steel 2 will be Justice League, but it might not be. I mean, I won't, I won't keel over of shock and surprise if it's not. I'm just saying my guess. 
It's my guess. So uh, yeah, there you go. All right, let's move on to the next question. And the next question on Twitter comes from Rendell Sanchez, who writes, uh, at AMC Movie News, question, hey, John, my question is, has AMC and you ever thought uh, to do a movie trivia game show? Um, That's interesting. Okay, so here's the deal. Um, I, much like Marvel, to steal Marvel terminology, I've broken down the development of AMC Movie News into three phases. <clears throat> Phase one was getting a daily movie talk show up and running and established. And then as we came into 2014, Phase two was to, to number one, move into and get into a better production studio, which we did back in October. And number two, develop some new shows. We now have several weekly shows that we do. We have AMC Versus. Uh, we have AMC Coming Soon. And we have uh, AMC Spoilers. Uh, and Spoilers, we don't do every week. We do about two a month. Um, and we have one or two other things we're looking at doing as well. And then in phase three, we have bigger plans. Uh, but we have to see if we can get to phase three first. So, you know, I like to get one thing under my belt at a time. Let's get phase one done. Did it work? Are we established? Has, has it really been, do we knock it out of the park? If yes, then let's move on to phase two. Uh, and phase two is still really for us in its infancy. Um, we're still trying to figure out how AMC versus works. Cause you know, we're, we're, we're tinkering with the rules every week. I love it. I gotta tell you right now, I think AMC versus might be my favorite thing that we do. I absolutely love it. Um, but, but we're just starting with it. And so we need to tinker with it for a couple of months to get it. Cause remember AMC movie talk today doesn't look like AMC movie talk looked a year ago. You know, we, we fiddled, we tinkered, we adjusted, we improved things, we upgraded here and there. And, and we need a chance to do that for AMC Versus as well. So AMC, I'm sure AMC Versus, the way it looks today is going to look kind of different to what it looks like three months from now, but we're still finding our footing with it. Uh, AMC Coming Soon is the newest one we just started, and I love it. Um, Aaron Darling hosts it, and what it is, it's a short video we put up every week that basically gives information to everybody about the new movies that are opening. Um, and we, you know, I decided that Aaron was the, the best person to host that and she's doing a dynamite job with it. Uh, the second episode of coming soon, uh, will be up online on Monday. Um, so lots of really good, exciting things. I love doing, uh, I love everything that we're doing right now. Spoilers is a lot of fun. It's very casual, kind of a review show, uh, a movie trivia game. Here's the problem with a movie trivia game show. Because that would require contestants and getting people in and organize. I, I don't know that that's in our wheelhouse. I think it's a really cool sounding idea. But the, all the shows that we do are me and my staff. And I don't know that I want to get into trying to run something that involves recruiting contestants and prizes and all that kind of stuff. To me, it just, it's beyond my wheelhouse. So I... It's a very interesting idea. It's a very interesting idea. But I think for me, it's it's not something that is, that's not something for me to run. Um, and um, it's probably a little bit outside of the scope of what we're doing. So I, I'm, I'm gonna say no, but it's such a great idea that I'm sure it's one we're gonna have to talk about in the future. So thank you so much for the email, interesting idea. Uh, all right, let's move on to the next Twitter question. We've got a few minutes left. And the next Twitter question comes to us from uh, John2K90. And John2K90 writes, why doesn't DC release any of its animated in theater? Is it that they're afraid uh, after the Batman Phantasm flop? Oh, I guarantee you right now, you release any of those DC movies in theater, they flop. Guaranteed. Absolutely 100% guaranteed they flop. Uh, no, nobody will go to see them. Uh, I mean, by nobody, of course, I mean... I'm using hyperbole. What I mean is a very small number, a very small, tiny number. You put Justice League War, um, which is the the new DC animated film that everybody's raving about right now. You put that in theater, doesn't make $5 million. Just doesn't. Um, the average film goer is not going to pay to go see that. Um, now, look, here's the thing. I'm just being real. Like people often say, if I say something won't make money, People take that as me saying that, oh, that thing sucks. Not at all. I watched Justice League War. And while I don't think it's quite as good as everybody's raving about, I thought it was a pretty damn good little animated movie. Um, I thought it was good. But just because I think it's good, understand this. Just because something is good, these are two separate issues. Is something good? Will it succeed in theater for the general movie going audience? Those are two different issues. 
I think Justice League War is good, but I also know that nobody's going to go see it in theater. So no, and, and that's why DC knows that. If DC thought for one second, if Warner Brothers DC thought for one second that one of their animated movies would make profit in theater, they would do it. They're smart. They know what they're doing. And DC knows that they won't make any money in theater. They know that. They know that the best place for their animated films is direct-to-video. That's their best approach. And that's why they're doing it. And that's why fans who like the stuff have their best way of seeing it. So I think, I don't think fans should worry about, the fans of the DC animated stuff shouldn't worry about it getting to the big screen because that's ultimately not, not what's best for it. Um, what's best for the DC animated stuff is the direct to home video stuff. And, and that's why they are able to make money and continue, continue to crank them out so that fans can see them. Um, but if they went into theater would not work, would not work at all. And that's why DC hasn't done it. And that's why Marvel hasn't done it. Uh, cause they know this. Uh, all right. The next question comes to us from Charles Smith. Uh, Chuck's. Dofer, I, I like your I like your Twitter Twitter handle, Chuck. Uh, and Chuck writes, um, "What are the chances we will see the next Percy Jackson movie, or is it start? Is it time to start counting down to the reboot?" Um, you know, let me double check here. Let me let me pull this up. Um, let me go to Box Office Mojo because if I remember right, the last Percy Jackson movie didn't do horribly. Percy Jackson. Let's see here. Percy Jackson and the Sea of Monsters, uh, quite contrary. I mean, it didn't do bad. It made almost two hundred million worldwide. the The problem comes with that it costs ninety million to make. Um, figure they probably put in a good twenty five million to market it. So now you're up from ninety to one hundred and fifteen, and then from that two hundred million, you have to take away about seventy million that stays with the film exhibitors. So now your 200 million is roughly about 130. Then producers get their cut and whatever. But I'm I'm going to go out and limb and say Percy Jackson broke even. Maybe even made a little bit of money. Maybe a little bit. Um, but the question is, how much did the first Percy Jackson movie make worldwide? Worldwide, the first Percy Jackson movie made almost 30 million more. So here's what studios don't like to see. They don't like seeing this. So. While the first, this past Percy Jackson movie probably broke even, maybe even made a little bit of money, it less people went to go see it than went to go see the first one. Um, so I'm guessing they're probably not going to make a third one. I hope I'm wrong. I, I actually like Percy, Percy Jackson, I do. So I hope I'm wrong about that. But my guess at this point is they probably won't make a third one. I know some people said, oh no, they've announced they're making a third one. No, they did not. Nobody has announced anything. There are some rumors going around that they're going to make a third one, but I don't personally believe them. But you never know. I mean, they might. And I hope that they do. But my guess, if I had to put money on it and make a wild guess right now, my guess is that we will not see a Percy Jackson 3. Um, if, if any, maybe a reboot, but a reboot in 10, 15 years, maybe. So, uh, so I doubt it. All right. Next Twitter question comes to us from Justin Hesse and Justin Hesse is writing, uh, at AMC movie news. Hey, AMC, love the show. My questions, uh, my question is about phase four of the Marvel cinematic universe. What movies do you want to see? And who do you think the Avengers will fight way too far off? No idea. Um, we haven't even started phase three yet. And we've got four or five movies to get through before we start talking phase four. So um, <clears throat> who would I like to see? Um, man, I, I mean, I don't know. Because you got to strike that balancing act of, do you do another Thor, Captain America, Iron Man? Uh, I'd like to see Hulk. But... But any more speculation after that, we're still five, six years away from phase four. So I'm not ready to speculate too much on that one yet. All right. Next question comes to us from Chris Martin. And Chris Martin writes, uh, is there any more development on the live action Disney Cruella movie? Good question. Um, Cruella. Yeah, I remember we even talked about that uh, a long time ago on AMC Movie Talk. And... I believe the full title is going to be Cruella de Vil, I believe. And honestly, I've heard nothing more. I'm pulling it up on IMDb right now. And it just says in development. 
But right now, uh, at least on IMDb, there's no director attached, there's no producers attached, there's no cast attached. Um, but yeah, a good one. I totally forgot about that. We I, It might have been a year ago that they first announced they were going to try to do a Cruella movie, which is actually kind of fascinating. But you watch this. If Maleficent with Angelina Jolie that's coming out, if that's a big hit, and I suspect it will be, if Maleficent is a big hit, um, then... I, I got to believe they'll go back into production or they'll really ramp things up with Cruella. Um, but as of right now, I haven't heard any, any more development on it. All right, next, uh, I got time for just a couple more. So let's go over to Rendell Sanchez, who write, wrote in at AMC Movies. Question, hey, John, did you see Star Wars at the so- uh, Sochi Winter Olympics? If not, look it up on YouTube. Thanks. Um, I didn't watch the video. I saw like at at Walkers attacked the, the Winter Olympics or something like that. Everybody's telling me it's really funny. I haven't checked it out yet. I need to. So when I do, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it. Uh, next question comes in from, uh, well, I already took one from Chris Martin. So we will go on to the next one. Seth Hodges writes, uh, does future movie announcements cut down on the suspense? We know that Spider-Man won't die because we know there will be a third. Uh, well, did anybody think Spider-Man was going to die? I, I, I mean, I see where you come from because I have the same kind of criticisms about prequels. One of the things about prequels I don't like, and there are many things I don't like about prequels in general, uh, but one of the things is just one aspect is you, you don't wonder if these two will get together because you know they do or you know they don't. You don't wonder if that guy is going to make it out of this car crash because you already know if he does or if he doesn't. You already know a lot of the things that takes out some of the suspense. But I think there's a little bit of... Remember, I'm saying there's many things about prequels that I just generally don't like. That's just one small aspect of it. Um, But with Spider-Man, it's different because in announcing a Spider-Man 3, the only thing you know is that Spider-Man lives through Spider-Man 2. That's the only thing you know. For all you know, Aunt May becomes... I don't know. Aunt May becomes Kingpin. For all you know. I I mean, that's not what happens in comic books. But I mean... Between Spider-Man 2 and 3, Aunt May could become Kingpin. Um, let, let's say, um, I don't know, Electro becomes a pacifist plumber. Um, everybody in the city dies. I mean, so the only one detail we know with the announcement of a Spider-Man 3 and Spider-Man 4 is that Spider-Man lives. That That's it. So I don't think that takes away much of the suspense Um uh, personally, because it's it's and besides, who who would have thought? Who would actually believe that Spider Man dies, or would think that Spider Man was going to die in the movie anyway? Probably none of us. So, not a big deal. Uh, next question comes to us from Rendell Sanchez, um, and you know, Rendell I already asked one from Rendell, so I'm going to move down here, and we've got uh, Black Panther. Joel Williams, 21, writes. Uh, oh, that wasn't for the question. Uh, Lee. Volkel writes, um, do you think we're going to get a Jack Ryan sequel? Shadow Recruit made $121 million worldwide. Um, I'm going to have to go out on a limb and say no. Because one of the things that studios look for, it made $120 million worldwide, cost 60 million to make. Uh, you got to figure it's uh, going to cost... They probably put about 30 plus million into the marketing. So that takes this $60 million figure and makes it closer to 90 million. Uh, this worldwide number of 116, well, now you got to take away about 30% of that. In this case, you're probably talking about roughly $40 million. Uh, you take away from this, which leaves you around 80 million. So now suddenly Jack Ryan lost money. Um, and it did. Jack Ryan uh, lost money for the studio. And on top of that, Sometimes you can have a movie that loses money and still do a sequel if the studio thinks there's big potential for a better result next time. But the thing is, not a lot of people like Jack Ryan Shadow Recruit. It didn't get great critic results. It didn't get great fan feedback either. So a, there's no reason for a studio to think that if we make another one in this series right now, we'll get a better result than we did with this one because it's likely to do this because a lot of the people didn't like the first one. So the first one lost money. Generally speaking, people weren't thrilled with it. Not a lot of high expectation that if they do another one, it would be any improvement. 
So I really doubt we're going to see a, a Jack Ryan sequel. All right, uh, let's going to take two more. I'll go through these pretty quick. Uh, first one, uh, Andrew Gifford writes, uh, what video games would you like to see become film adaptations? I've mentioned this a lot, but the, the two I'm most interested in right now are the ones that are in development, which is Assassin's Creed with Michael Fassbender and World of Warcraft, uh, which is coming. Very, very excited about both of those. So let's... And I think the the future of video game movies will depend a lot about on how these two films do. And I think they're going to do pretty well. We'll see. Uh, the next one comes from Alan Monroe, who writes, Would you like the Marvel uh, Cinematic Universe join the villains in Avengers 3? For example, Loki, Red Skull, Abomination, and Ultron, and Thanos, the leader, and fight. Uh, and in Avengers 4, fight them. Um, no, sounds a little convoluted to me. Sounds sounds a little too crowded and convoluted to me. Um, I already took one from Star Killer, so let's go, uh, Mr. Crouchy Man, <laughs> who writes a uh, question. Hey, John, uh, just curious. If I wanted to send you guys fan mail, where can I do that to? You can send any email to amcmovietalk at gmail .com. That's uh, where you send all your email to us to amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Uh, next one comes from Aaron Baylock, who writes, chances the new Star Wars films ignore the prequels altogether. High chance. High chance. I don't think you'll see anything in the new Star Wars movies that will contradict uh, the prequels, but I really doubt you're going to see much reference to them whatsoever. At least that's kind of uh, what I hope. Uh, let's see. The next one. Chris Warden writes in, if Man of Steel 2 fails to make over a billion dollars uh, at the worldwide box office, will you consider that a disappointment? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, I mean, I'll be surprised if it doesn't make uh, over a billion at the worldwide box office, but this movie makes 700 million. Let's put it. Batman vs. Superman makes 600 million. I'll consider that a disappointment. It'll be profitable and it'll make them money, and it'll give them enough fuel to keep moving with their DC Cinematic Universe, and nobody has to consider it a failure, but I would be disappointed with that. Because if you make less money than Man of Steel, then you gotta, and I think Man of Steel came roughly a little over 600 million, I believe. Let me pull up the numbers here. Um, Man of Steel worldwide made, I mean, domestically it made almost 300. Worldwide, Man of Steel made $670 million. That's great, especially considering it was coming off of uh, Superman Returns, which a lot of people thought was a disappointment and would hinder the chances of Man of Steel being that big of a success. It's coming off of Green Lantern, which a lot of people were disappointed with, and yet it still made nearly $670 million worldwide. But now that you're building on that and you're bringing Batman into it, you're damn right you better make more than Man of Steel did. Now you got to. Um, I, but look, let's put it this way. They'll be happy if they, if it hits 800 million, they'll be happy. If they hit a billion. They'll be thrilled If they hit 1.5 billion. They're, you know, developing cocaine problems, uh, because they're so exuberantly out of their minds, happy. Um, so if it makes under a billion disappointed, no billions, a huge number, huge number DC cinematic universe, still getting its legs under it. Um, so I would not consider it. Do I think it'll make a billion? Yes. Disappointment if it doesn't? No. Um, it, makes under, it makes 600 million? That's got to be into disappointment category when you make less money than the previous film. And you've added Batman. Crazy. All right. Uh, one more here. One more and then we will call it a day if I can get this thing to come up. Here we go. Um, uh, now I'm going to be picky. I'm just going in order. Let's see. I'm looking, I'm looking. Okay, let's try this. Um, from Coastal Seek who writes, will Star Wars up the visual effects again? Um, well, I mean, the nice thing about Star Wars and Industrial Light and Magic and everything is they always up the ante when it comes to visual effects. As, as much as I crap on the prequels all the time, well-deserved, but as much as I do, the visual effects in The Phantom Menace, and a lot of people dismiss them just because the movie was bad. Put that aside. The visual effects and the visuals in The Phantom Menace, uh, Attack of the Clones, Revenge of the Sith, they're all 
mind boggling good. I worked in the visual effects industry uh, and I was working as a producer in the visual effects industry when um, the first Phantom Menace came out. And I literally went to the theater 16, 17, 18 times. Um, number one, because of Star Wars, my whole life is about Star Wars and it was the first new Star Wars movie, but also because we were all just so, our jaws were just on the floor with what they were able to accomplish in The Phantom Menace. It's insanely good. It re-upped the industry. It really did. Um, and anybody who denies that is just a Star Wars hater. I, I am a prequels hater and I will tell you visual effects at the time had never been equaled. They, they broke new ground. They did things in there that had never been done before uh, and did them beautifully well. And um, so, yeah. Anyway, guys, that'll do for me. We're at, uh, we're approaching over 50 minutes now. So that'll do for us. I will be back again tomorrow for more AMC Mailbag. Taking more of your questions. Don't forget, email your questions to me at amcmovietalk at gmail.com or if you want to roll the dice and see if you can maybe get a short question in, tweet. Tweet a question to me at AMC Movie News. So you can either tweet a question to me at AMC Movie News or email a question to us at AMC Movie Talk. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. Don't forget, lots of great films playing right now in AMC Theaters everywhere. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater, showtime, and movie ticket information. I've been getting a lot of people asking for audio-only versions because we do put out the audio podcast of AMC Movie Talk Monday through Friday. And a lot of people have been asking for audio versions of Mailbag as well. I think we're going to start doing that in the near future. So keep your eye open for that. We'll let you know. Thanks a lot for joining us, guys. I'll be back again tomorrow with more Mailbag. Thanks for joining me. My name is John Campy for AMC Movie News. And until next time, bye-bye. If you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe to AMC Movie News on YouTube. It's free and a great way to stay updated with all the latest movie news and check out our daily show, AMC Movie Talk. Also, don't forget to check us out on Facebook and Twitter to stay in the loop for our special prizes, giveaways, and contests.